behalf of the NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering, a warm welcome to our conference on equal opportunity. You can imagine that we, as we are living in these difficult and unpredictable times of Corona, we had to reschedule this conference and change the format of this conference several times. Now this conference is uh, taking place today, in the afternoon and tomorrow afternoon as a Zoom conference. Today's session is a plenary session open to all and marks the first session of a total of four sessions. The next three sessions are closed events and will be round table discussions with specialists in the field on special equal opportunity topics. And uh, a lot of uh, the participants that are participating today will be, will, will be seeing them again in the, today or tomorrow. We are extremely happy to have one Professor Dr. Tom Welton as speaker for our conference. Uh, and I would like to introduce you very shortly. And Tom, you uh, you add or comment if, if I say something wrong. Tom Welton is currently president of the Royal Society of Chemistry and professor of sustainable chemistry at the Imperial College London. For him, sustainable chemistry is both the implementation of sustainability in the production and use of chemicals and the application of chemistry and chemical products to enable sustainable development. He's the author of over 140 research papers, mostly on the structures and chemistry of ionic liquids and solutes in these. Prior to this, he was Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences at the Imperial College and before the head of the Department of Chemistry at Imperial College. He's widely acknowledged to be a champion of diversity in science and was head of department when the chemistry department at the Imperial College won its first Athena Swan Gold Award. Together with Alison Roger of the University of Warwick, he founded the Irene Juliet Curie Conference Series. He's a L'Oreal UNESCO male champion for women in science, a member of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Boards of both UPRI and Elsevier. In recognition of these activities, he was awarded an OBE, Officer of the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honours 2017. Before I continue to explain the format and program of this first session, I would like to pass the word to Professor Dr. Thomas Ward, the Director of the NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering. Please, Tom. Thank you, Hala. So first of all, I'd like to thank you, Hala and, and Ralph, of the equal opportunity of the NCCR for initiating and coordinating this, and obviously Tom Welton for agreeing to deliver a, a talk we tells us is usually very interactive, and this is quite a challenge in the COVID slash Zoom times. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that there are so many people that are attending that are not part of our molecular systems engineering NCCR, and I will take a few seconds to try to define what we view as molecular systems engineering. So in, in stark contrast to the other NCCRs that are, are running within Switzerland that have names that most people can easily identify to, for example, anti-resist, which is antibiotic resistance, or uh, you know, quantum computing or sustainable chemistry, molecular systems engineering is much harder to define. And it's the result of a joint initiative between the Department of Chemistry at the University of Basel and the newly founded Department of Bioscience Systems Engineering from the ETH Zurich, which is established in Basel. And we saw an opportunity to merge forces between chemistry and synthetic biology to create something new. And the, the, the easiest way I have identified to describe our efforts is what we like to call either molecular or cellular prosthetics. So you, some of the older people in the audience might remember in the 70s, there were two TV series called The Six Million Dollar Man and The Bionic Woman. And again, these people had some issues with some, you know, organs and they had to have prosthetics installed. And we like to think that we are now at a stage where we can actually engineer either molecular, so molecules or cellular prosthetics within a cell or an organ or even in a human. And this might either 
restore function or create new function. And um, in, in terms of, of outcome that we have achieved in the first six years of this NCCR, I'd like to say that we have this very successful initiative in aiming at restoring vision by genetic means. There, there's a very interesting initiative in the, in the novel um, diabetes treatments. And more recently, there's some, some very interesting work on the, on the microbiome research. So there, it's very clear from a health issue that what you have in terms of microbes in your gut plays a very important role in your humor and even in your health. And we have very elegant means using uh, some advanced molecular biology techniques to follow this and to try to predict, you know, upcoming diseases and so on and so forth. In terms of importance of, of equal opportunities, I would like just to mention that arguably the two most important Nobel Prizes that have been awarded in the past three years were awarded to women, namely directed evolution, which is absolutely central to at least 60% of the research we do was awarded to Frances Arnold at Caltech. And this year it was awarded to two women, namely Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley and um, Emmanuel Charpentier at the MPI in, in Berlin. And again, this clearly recognizes that, that the, the influence of, of women in, in science is immense and it has been, in many people's opinion, underestimated in the, the past decades. And it's very pleasing to see that people come to realize that their influence and impact is absolutely central to the quality and the creativity that is essential for, for good research. So in, in terms of, of NCCR and, and gender equal, equal, equality, I should say that we, we are more and more becoming aware of the fact that all of us have an unconscious bias and I think the first step in, in trying to address this is becoming, becoming aware of this unconscious bias and finding ways to, whenever you feel that you know, something in the back of your mind is not quite right, you should be aware and try to, try to fix this by any means. And we're very thankful to uh, Andrea Zimmermann and Flor Weibel who will be in touch with us later on this afternoon and tomorrow for scrutinizing our behavior and coming up with some, some interesting solutions and, and remedies to our, our unconscious bias. So again, in, in terms of numbers, I don't want to throw any numbers at you, but I think the NCCR is doing just about as bad or as well as, as most efforts within, uh, within Switzerland. So there is very clearly a, a leaky pipeline, as people like to call it. So we're losing a lot of, of precious women collaborators at, at early stages and most importantly when it comes to become an independent professor it's, it's really uh, quite dramatic so we're, we're working hard on improving this we have some some numbers that we are reasonably proud of but we realize that there's plenty of room to improve on these issues so i think i've spoken long enough i'd like to thank once again tom welton for coming out and, and speaking and entertaining us via zoom which all of us who have done Zoom remote conferences know it's not even close to being the same as a, as a live face-to-face -face, you know, encounter, but nonetheless, I'm sure we'll have a very enjoyable <laughs> and we'll learn a lot. So thanks again, Tom, and I pass the book back to Paula for the introduction of the, the presentation. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom Welton's explicit wish was not to hold a speech but be able to answer your questions on this topic and rather have an interactive exchange with you than a mere presenting of slides. Therefore, he will introduce first the topic of equal opportunity and then the floor will be open to your questions. We are very grateful for the interest this conference has triggered, but because of the number of attendees, we have decided that it would be best to have the questions incoming via chat. I will watch the chat carefully and will pose then the questions to Tom. Uh, just for, for the length of time that we have together, the conference will end at 10 past three uh, this afternoon. Please be also aware that we will record this session and the summary will be then accessible via our NCCR MSE website. Now, uh, I wish us all an interesting conference and engaging exchange with Professor Dr. Tom Welton. Thank you so much, Tom, for being here, and the floor is yours.
No, thank you, Hella, for the um, kind introduction and, of course, for the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you also to Tom for the same reasons. And, and so welcome, everybody, to um, my kitchen. Um, I always have to point out that this is not a drinks cabinet. It is a glasses cabinet. <laughs> the drinks are kept somewhere quite different. OK, so on to today's talk. And as Hella said, what I will do is attempt in some way to replicate the, the way in which these things are done um, when they are a live in-person presentation. And so I will you know, probably go through a few slides, stop sharing my screen and explicitly ask for questions and comments. And, and I do really mean um, comments, not just questions. You know, it is okay to object to something that I have just said. I am not the grand poo bar of diversity. All I am is somebody who happened to uh, be the chair of a chemistry department where, when that chemistry department decided it wanted to take action on diversity. So I have no you know, magic wand. I have um, no really greater knowledge, certainly of the theory of um, this area than any of you do and your opinions are just as valid as mine and you know there are many times when I've given a presentation like this and somebody has you know challenged what I've said and, and actually my reaction has been oh I've never quite thought about it like that before you make a good point and so you know that's as it is as valid to do that as it is to ask a question. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction so um, so this is the Royal Society of Chemistry, of which I am currently president, um, and it is a professional body. So it is a scholarly society, but it is actually a professional body. So to be a full member of the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, you have to have either a qualification at degree level in chemistry or equivalent. You know, you could be um, have come through as an apprentice um, or, or to have significant experience in your working life of chemistry to be one of those 50,000 professional members that we have worldwide. We are a major publisher um, with 35,000 articles published last year. And indeed, one of our most recent reports and actions has been around uh, gender disparities in publishing. In ordinary world, we have lots of um, events um, so in this is 2019, we had over 2,000 events with 15,000 delegates. It's, that's all happening in the new Zoom world. Um, it's interesting, I see a transition now. So what was happening in April is we, and I think you know, every organization was doing its best to think, how can I replace what we were doing last month with something that we're doing on Zoom? And I think the interesting thing that I see with the Royal Science of Chemistry and other organizations is people are starting to say, well, actually, if I'm going to be in the virtual world, what can the virtual world supply that um, the, the real world didn't? And very simple things like the recording of this talk um, is much easier when it's done via Zoom. And so people who can't make this talk um, can see it. And, and, and experiences such as uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one morning I was at a conference in Australia and by the afternoon I was at a conference in America. Um, of course, both of which I was sitting in this chair for. And so, you know, so actually there are positive things um, that I think are starting to come out of the emergency changes that we've made. Um, so the, the society um, is large in terms of its staff as well. It has almost um, 600 staff and offices around the world. So I just wanted to introduce you to the Royal Society of Chemistry. Right, and so let's start with this. And so I think what one of the things that we can all agree is, you know, the problems are well known. And in re one regard, that is true. And so here are the Royal Society of Chemistry reports. Of course, I, I advertise these, one, because I'm advertising, but two, also because I've <laughs> got the PDFs of the front covers and so I can put them into a PowerPoint presentation um, without having to do too much work. And, and over years we've seen reports like these, even um, pre uh, 
predecessor reports on diversity in the chemical sciences, exploring the workplace for LGBT plus science, scientists, breaking the barriers, which is about women's retention and pro, uh, progression. As I said, a report on um, uh, publishing in the chemical sciences. And of course, the same could be true. I could be speaking from the Institute of Physics and I would give you a set of similar um, uh, front covers. I could be speaking from the ACS. So there, there are many, many, many of these reports that have now been made. And, and so consequently, what I won't do is to produce a lot of graphs showing things called leaky pipelines and the like, because those can be found in reports. But I think one of the things that's important to understand in this area is whilst there absolutely are these large society scale um, issues that can be identified, there are also um, the translate, there is also the translation of those into what is happening where you are. And so it's absolutely vital, and of course you are doing this, um, that we don't just think, oh, I've read the reports, I know what's going, I know what's going on, let's you know, charge ahead. It's really, really important to have a local understanding of how that society, those societal issues are translating where you are. Because on that micro scale, they are, there are often really important differences. And, and even within, say, the same university, the experience of someone in the chemistry department isn't necessarily the same as the experience of a similar person in the physics department. And so we need to think about the size of our cultures and the size of our communities. And I think this is a, a really important issue in the sense of you know, what we can think of in terms of communities of action. And I think that there are natural groupings that, that come together. There are sizes of people. So there's a kind of transition, isn't there, of, of a, a department where the department is small enough that everybody knows everybody. You know, they know the names of the children of everybody in the department. You know, it's a, a very small um, unit where there is a particular way of operating and there are tools that can be used that are very different to if you're in a large department or covering a whole faculty where it is not possible to know everybody. And so the, the tools that you have available to you and the things that you need to do are very, very different. And it's that local knowledge which really informs the kind of day-to-day -day things that, that, that need to happen where you actually work. And so um, later on today, um, you will be finding out the results of an inquiry about yourselves. And um, that will be, um, I hope, both informative and useful to you. So let's think about how the problems are well known in other ways. And so here is um, uh, one of those memes that knocks around, um, you know, they are just cartoons. I think people, people sometimes overread over too much into these and, and somehow think that, you know, in some little cartoon, which is an illustration of some idea that one has embedded um, your entire thinking. That is, is not the case. They are merely cartoons that can help a little bit of thinking. And, um, and on the left hand side here, you know, so what you can see, if you like, is what people often think about when talking about um, e equality or equality of opportunity, those kinds of ideas, that what we see is all three of our, all three of our, uh, of our people have been given the, the equality of opportunity. They've all been given the same box on which to stand. And yet, what we see is that um, uh, one of them in particular <laughs> sees nothing other than the fence. And so this equality maybe isn't quite the way in which we would be thinking about this. And people then talk about equity. Again, the words don't really matter. Um, where what you're doing is you kind of think, well, what are we trying to enable these people to do? 
And how can we individually support those in the way that they need to be supported to be able to uh, do the thing that they need to be able to do, which in this case, of course, is to see over the front um, so that they can see the baseball map. Of course, often, this is the reality of the situation. And we need to look at that. In order to be able to understand what's happening, we do actually need to look at the reality of the situation and to ask ourselves questions of what are we like? What do we do? How do we behave? And to really take a, a brutal look in the mirror and recognize our organization, our grouping for how they actually are. But also I quite like this one, which is um, actually, maybe, maybe the fence doesn't have to be there. Maybe, maybe the thing to do is to recognize the, um, the inequity that exists, recognize the equality, the inequality that exists and take away its root cause. And I think this is particularly um, useful when talking about what we often find that, that people say, uh, certainly it, it was true at Imperial College, is, oh, well, we've always done it like that. It has to be done like that. And then you say, oh, but why does it have to be done like that? Well, because we've always done it like that. And you get into this cyclic argument of not being able to change anything because we've always done it like that. And then, of course, you know, uh, very often with me, I find, I, I always find parties very useful, you know, at, 10 o'clock at night on my sixth glass of wine, I'm talking to um, some very old professor who says, oh no, the reason we did it like that was just because, you know, it was, it, it was one of three ways we could have done it and we picked that one. <laughs> and there was nothing, you know, there wasn't even a great reason for the original decision. And, and so what we can think about is, can we do things just differently so that those inequities get taken away. The barrier itself was the problem, not how many boxes that people had to see over the barrier. And um, I think, yeah, I will, not do, I will not do that one next. What I think I would t tell you about is just, I'll give you one anecdote, which I think helps, and ask you in the telling of that anecdote, what why, I, why do you want to take action on this? Because I think it's very easy for us to say, well, these problems are well known, we need to take action. And that has been true certainly throughout my, my lifetime, probably, well, certainly for centuries, and yet for most of that time, no action has been taken. And that is really where we started at in Imperial College, which was finding a reason to act. And the reason for us came from this. So I, I became head of Department of Chemistry. I'd been director of teaching before. And, and in that role, I'd had to attend the Departmental External Advisory Board, um, which was uh, day-long meeting where we had interminable um, conversations with, you know, professors from other leading chemistry departments. And, you, you know, I would, have, I would have rather poked my eyes out than spend that day. But I had to. And then I became head of department. And I thought, I don't need to do that anymore. I can just stop. And what I didn't do was get rid of the, uh, the external advisory board. I just kind of spent a minute thinking, well, what do I want the external advisory board to be and to do? And so the first thing I did was get rid of all the professors from other um, universities, because what seemed to me to be, you know, just obvious is if I want advice, I want advice from people who've got different experiences and knowledge than I have. So this isn't me thinking about, you know, diversity. It's just me thinking, I don't want to sit around a table having, having a conversation with somebody who's got all the same experiences as me, moaning about the same stuff. I want people that have got different backgrounds, different experiences, who might be able to help me with something that I don't know. 
So we reformulated the board um, completely differently with people from, so people from industry, people from, you know, we're in London, so people from the commercial sector, the banking sector, people from charities, people from um, uh, civil servants, you know, a completely different set of people. And then of course, they, as they did, they asked me to do a presentation of the strategy, which I did. And our strategy was to be the best chemistry department in um, Europe. And, and of course, I talked about lots of nano, lots of bio, and various other thingios that um, I can't particularly remember now. And at the end of the, of the presentation, I sat down feeling very smug. And they said to me, oh, right, so what's your business plan? Silence. And eventually I said, to, well, what's one of them? And, and then we went through this wonderful process where they, you know, they took me as a, as, as a novice um, through the process of developing a business plan. And the first question they asked was, well, okay, so you've, you've, you've said you've got this aspiration to be the best. How would you know if you walked into the best chemistry department, how would you recognize it? And we decided that the thing to do was to ask the staff. And so we asked that very, very simple question. And we just, you know, waited and got the answers back. And I did think that I was going to get a lot of answers about nano this and bio that and micro the other. But I didn't. The answers that came back were essentially two. The, that we would be the department where the best and brightest chemists wanted to work. And we would be the department where the best and brightest chemists wanted to come and study. And then the next thing to do is so obvious. You just say, well, okay, so how close do we think we are to that? And at that time, we had uh, an academic staff of 40 something, and we had about 18 professors, one of which was a woman all of which were white. And it forced us to ask the question, do we think that that group of people, that photograph, if you like, looks like the group of people that are the best and brightest chemists that there are? And, you know, unless you believe, which fortunately we didn't, that um, white men from the home counties around London are better chemists than anybody else in the world? The answer was no. So what it did, it, it made us realize we were not achieving our ambition. So it wasn't that the diversity was the target, it had become the evidence the lack of diversity had become the evidence that we were not achieving what we had said we wanted to achieve. And so it gave a really powerful reason to start taking action. You know, even the, you know, shall we say the dinosaurs in the department, you know, with everybody has those. Even the, even the dinosaurs in the department kind of went, oh, we need to do better at this because we are not, we transparently, obviously are not achieving our ambition because that photograph would look different if we were. And so I'm going to stop sharing for a second now. So I can see the chats and um, Hannah is going to, to look at them, but I'm going to explicitly ask you what might be a reason for, I don't know if, I, I, don't, I don't care what scale you do it, your section, your um, institute, your department, your entire university, what might be some reasons that would resonate with your culture to act on diversity? Ah, 
as I say, fortunately, <laughs> they didn't. Um, uh, so, Hannah, I can see you talking, but I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, Red, let me read quickly the question. What if your department group thinks that the photograph of all white male are the best and brightest of what they do? So, I think, I, you know, I, I do get what you're saying. I genuinely think that nowadays that is less likely than it used to be. There is a time when that would have been, oh, well, it's just transparently obvious. Um, but I think that what you then have to do, you, you do do this a lot, is to think about, and, and this is a lesson, you know, this is a lesson I, I got from my husband a long, long time ago when I uh, very first started becoming a manager, is what is it that that person needs to hear in order to achieve the outcome that I want to happen, as opposed to what do I want to say? And and I think that that you know so the, the you know the anecdote was an example of that. It was how could that grouping hear what what I wanted to what I wanted to have happen by not saying what I wanted to say, which is you know look at this, it's patently obviously unfair that we only have one female professor, you know, and that would have gone in, it wouldn't have got the outcome. And so there is a thing about listening very carefully to the person who might be opposing you and think, what is it that, that matters to them? And you know what, one of the things which is really remarkable, and I've always, I always laugh inside at this, which is, the quickest way I know of changing the mind of one of those middle-aged men who thought that you know men are better and that this is all just you know some kind of hippie nonsense was for their daughter to go to university. And the thing that was remarkable, so clearly what was happening was their daughters, you know, and I had three or four examples of this in my department, their daughters were reporting the behaviors they were seeing at university. And their fathers, who love their daughters, were thinking, this is appalling. This can't be right. And they would, they, it would change their view. The thing that I, I, that I laugh about is they appeared not to care about the experiences, experiences that their wives and sisters were having. <laughs> it took it to be their daughter. But it is about that. It is about hearing what, hearing what matters to them and then talking about how this feeds what it is that they are trying to achieve. And let me give an example of one of the actions that we did. So we did this thing where um, we were uh, giving support to people writing research proposals in order for the success rate to increase. So it was had a kind of um, operational thing, but it was also about supporting, we're doing a way of talking about supporting support. And my chief dinosaur, I shan't say his name, um, had all, you know, anything like that that had been mentioned in the past would just, would cause a riot. He would, you know, the staff meeting would then end up and it would all be a mess. And I just thought, okay, I want this thing to happen. I am just going to have to swallow it. And I rang the dinosaur and said, you know, dear, ty dear Tyrannosaurus, um, I'm about to announce something at the staff meeting. Of course, it doesn't apply to you. And what I was announcing was that we were going to have this process by which we reviewed um, uh, people's proposals to help to improve the English. No one was going to change the science. You know, we were, we'd talk about improving the, the, the communication. And um, consequently, it didn't apply to him. The department meeting happened. He stayed quiet. We introduced the program. And about a year later, it was starting to show that it was having real success and people were um, uh, getting more grants and it, finding it very useful. And then one day I was in my office and um, it was Tyrannosaur on the, on the phone. And he said to me, Oh, I'm just um, uh, making a, an ERC application. Could you have a look through it before 
I send it off and I said, of course I can. And, and what he needed was a demonstration of the success of the action. And, and you could say, oh, well, you know, you, you know as, a, as a leader, you should have been more insistent and you should have, but if I'd have done that, if I'd have done saying what I wanted to say, he would have caused a riot, we would never have had the program. And do you know what? So, you know, what, what did he figure? So he would be at that time 5% of the academic staff he represented. 5% of the academic staff weren't involved in that program at the beginning. 95% of them were. And that's the thing that mattered. And then eventually, when he saw the success of it, he joined in. And actually, he's now, um, you know, very much um, one of the, the champions of um, the work that we've been doing around this because he does, he, kind of, he now gets it. So what else have we got? We have another comment, you know, in Switzerland, uh, systematic structures for childcare are quite wow. difficult. And uh, so there's a comment that we need the university to subsidize childcare and the PIs need to broaden their international networks to increase PhD and postdoc applications from non-Western countries. And at the same time, you know, childcare needs uh, to get more flexible, you know, for women to be able to join the workforce. Okay. Um, yes, we just, so, oh, you know, so there are many, many things in there. Um, and so where do we start? So one of the things I have to say is it is not my job and it never has been my job to correct the inequitable distribution of domestic labor in heterosexual relationships and you know we do have to recognize that as a key you know key problem and that the there's been a certain move over you know this century of move trying to move the whole of uh, gender politics into the workplace. Now, it does have a place in the workplace. The, the, the very things that I've been talking about um, are about the workplace, but it is broader than that. And without a, without a realignment of how we organize our societies, some of this stuff will be extremely difficult to achieve. Now, having said that, extremely difficult and impossible aren't the same thing. And that there are things that you can do. And so, yes, childcare is a key issue. Employers should provide um, affordable childcare. In the academic world, this is, so one of the things that, that we introduced, which was, you know, one, very successful, um, and two, very popular, was that we introduced a grant that um, uh, people who had had a career break, oh, and I, perhaps I should say that, so let me just deviate for a second. So we never, I don't think there is a single action that we took that you would describe as being for women. We took actions for people, and some of those actions, because the thing it was addressing um, was something that impacted women more, more women took advantage of it, but then there were also men that took advantage of it. And so our, um, our grant that we had for returning people from having had a career, blur, career break was of course mostly taken up by women who were returning from maternity leave. But it was also taken up by men who were returning from um, shared parental leave. It was also taken up by men who had had to um, take career breaks for um, other personal reasons. And so it was available to everyone, but the majority of people who were women returning from maternity leave. And so what we did was essentially we, we gave enough money for um, the equivalent of about a six month postdoc, um, uh, which the woman could, um, decide to sometimes that that postdoc might be um, for while 
the woman was actually on her maternity leave. Sometimes it was chosen that it would be at the point of return. That was, you know, entirely up to, to, to the person um, that was getting the grant. Of course, we also had a, um, a reduction of teaching responsibilities upon return, so the person could concentrate on um, research and getting themselves back up to speed. You know, the, the problem as we saw it, um, and, and what people were telling us, you know, it, what, what w women were telling us was, the problem isn't the nine months. <laughs> The problem is <laughs> the 20 years <laughs> and, and, and actually the, the, when we really got down into the detail and the detail matters, that's why I talked about you know, asking about what it's like in your place, what, what the women in the department were telling us is, you know, I come back to work, I've got a full teaching load, I've got a child that I've just left at home for the first time ever and I can't get back up to speed and get my research reinitiated, it's all too much. And then, I th and I think this is also important as well. And so then, as a head of department, I could make a judgment of, do I just say, isn't the world a wicked place? You know, smile sweetly, here's a cup of tea, um, off you go. And, or could I do something about this? And when I looked at the cost of supplying the support, and so instead of having a, wom a woman who'd returned from maternity leave being crippled and not being able to um, uh, get her research restarted, not being able to apply for grants, not winning grants, not bringing money into the department, all of the, you know, ending up getting an administrative role in order to, comp you know, that track. I could, make, I could make an investment on the return of, the, of this woman to the department. And, you know, in one level, fantastic for, you know, I, for being supportive and Tom is being supportive and lovely because everybody knows that Tom's supportive and lovely. But also I was making the best financial investment I could possibly make as a department chair because what would happen is that she would return from work, we would support her in getting her research back up and started, which is code for writing a research grant. <laughs> that gets funded and then the money comes back <laughs> because that grant was successful and so there's this whole thing about thinking about you know not just being it, it, in this in this field in this area some people believe that it is enough to be a nice person you know being a nice person is nice but it is not enough you have to really chisel into the detail, work out what it is that the problem is, work out how you solve that problem in the light of the situation in which you truly are. And we all know that, you know, there are other parts of my life where I might be saying that the, the well, actually, I, it, I might do it today, that the, you know, we, we label too much of what we label as excellence in science, what, as what we actually mean is success at grant applications and you know and that that but in a sense i do think that that, that, that is wrong and there is a long-term thing which might be about contributing to changing that but in the short term the reality is that what the narrow def definition of excellence in science really means success at grant applications and so therefore i need to help this person get back into successful grant applications and I could rail against the injustice of that, or I could provide something that fixes the problem as we have it today. Now that's, and I think that that's kind of um, an, an important view that I've always had, which is what I am trying to do is to make tomorrow in my world, in my sphere of influence, I'm trying to make tomorrow slightly more inclusive than yesterday was. I am not trying to solve the world's problems. I am, you know, if I want to do that, I can go and become a politician. What I'm trying to do is to solve small problems that are before us today. And of course, that, is, that means that there are many problems that aren't solved. 
it does mean that all we have done is taken the first two steps down a path that is a thousand miles long. But it's what I could do and what we as a department could do, given the constraints of all the stuff that was around us. Now I've gone off on some tangent. I've got no idea what the original question was. No, I've, I would like to get you back to the 95% that you've reached from, from uh, your colleagues. How, how were you able to convince them? Was it your message? Uh, did you use a quota? No, um, so it was you know, over the period of time. And you know, so when we first started talking about this, and I think actually, I think this is always managerially true, that there's, it seems to me it doesn't matter what it is, that about 40% of your staff will say, all right then, and get on with it. Um, about 20% of your staff will say, no, not ever, and rail against it. Maybe one day, I, maybe I will tell you about the whiteboards, blackboards thing, but you know, rail against it. And then another 40% of your staff are saying, well, show me why that's a good idea. And you, you deal with them you work differently. Um, and again, it's that thing about, so we were a department, like I said, but when I started, we had about 40 academic staff. When I finished as head of the department, we had 50. So that was a small enough group that I did know everybody. And also I'd been there forever. And so I knew everybody in, in that regard. And so you could judge what you were saying slightly differently to different people. You know, the ones who didn't need convincing, don't try and convince. You know, we, we have an expression about preaching to the choir. Um, you know, if they, if they already, you know, don't, don't waste your time trying to convince people who are already convinced. Also don't, waste your time, certainly at the beginning, in trying to convince people who can't be convinced. Work, on, work with those people who actually, with a little bit of giving them slightly more explanation, asking for their involvement, um, you know, showing them evidence, you know, what is it that that other 40% need? And then what sort of happens is they start dragging the others with them. And like I say, there is nothing like a success in their terms to persuade people that this is a sensible thing to do. And so, yeah, I mean, it's slow, it's steady. I don't, I don't, I don't think you can really do very much in this area by instruction. What you have to do is you do it by persuasion and demonstration and, and recognition that you know so i talked about some quite big things so i talked about you know a policy for um uh what we what we will do with uh, with a grant for people returning um from um some kind of um career break you know there are a lot there are policy things and they're only one of the areas of action and in fact not necessarily even the most important i think there are people's experiences, um, I won't go back to the slide, people's experiences are made up from, you know, what is it like when I go to work, I go into work on a Tuesday morning and this is what I experience. And what they're experiencing is not usually policy. You know, policies are beautifully written and put in, in um, filing cabinets and forgotten about, mostly. They're probably not even experiencing, which is something that senior managers have to get their heads around, the formal procedures. You know, I, I, I hate to think how many files of formal procedures were in the Dean's office, the vast majority of which were never really followed. You know, they might be followed a bit, um, but actually what happened was in this department, they'd have worked out, oh, hang on, we think this is a better way of doing it. And in that department, they'd worked out, oh, we think that's a better way. Of it. So actually the formal procedures weren't being followed. What people actually experiencing, uh, are experiencing are simple day-to-day -day events, which are most of them very small 
and not insignificant, but seemingly. So something that I did, which was a very small thing. And again, so this came from not me necessarily thinking about diversity, but being in this case quite selfish. Um, in that, you know, when my predecessor was um, uh, the person in the head of department's office, so there was a corridor of um, administrative staff that that office was on. And whenever I went up to that corridor, every door, every door on that corridor was shut. And when I became head of department, the first thing I decided to do was my door was going to be open. And so I opened my door. But also that office was situated above the main entrance, directly above the main entrance. And we had a long, thin building. And at the other end was essentially a fire escape. It was an entrance that you could use, but you know, a, a small entrance at the other end of the building. And I also made the decision that I would never use the main entrance. I would only ever use the entrance at the other end of the building. And that meant every time I entered the building, I had to walk through the building. And every time I left it, I had to walk through the building. And as I did that, every time I saw somebody, I would say, hello, how are you? Are you having a good day? You know, you know not a 10 minute conversation, but you know, literally just passing the time of day. And within three months, all of those closed doors were open doors. All of those people who used to, and again, this is the, the thing. So I, I did that entirely because I'm a social person and I wanted to feel I was in a social space. It, that, it was selfish. But what it also led to was a feeling of community amongst the people who had formerly not really felt they were in a community, they felt they were just going in and doing their job. But also what it did was, of course, they were all people whose jobs had different demands at different times. And what they used to do, they used to go in, they used to do their job, and if their job was busy, they were busy. If their job was in a quiet time, they were quiet. But what they had started to do was to help each other. So if somebody was busy when someone else was quiet, the one who was quiet would say, well, I can help you with that. And so, again, its business consequence was beneficial as well. So it had felt much nicer for me. People felt part of the community. They felt much more included. And for diversity, that, you know, I'm an absolute advocate of inclusion. But also, it became more effective in the business. And I would say that was true of pretty much everything we did. It wasn't, you know, there, there was no conflict between um, our actions which were around diversity and our actions which were around making the department be a better department. They were the same action. <laughs> it was absolutely the same, but you get these double successes. And also it was kind of, there are a million things that you might do. And, you know, why not take the, why not take the, the actions that are gonna have double successes? rather than the ones that are just going to have single successes, if you're going to have successes. So actually, I, so I do also need to talk about failures. And they will happen. You know, if you are going to start to um, make changes, sometimes you'll make the wrong change, <laughs> or you'll make a change that doesn't have the outcome that you, um, you expected it to have, or you would, you know, let me give you let me give you a trivial example but i think you know trivial examples are often the best so one of the things i i did when i started um the department i used to have a a, a piece of paper written in pencil on my desk and at the top of piece of the piece of paper it said tom's secret strategy <laughs> and he used to sit on my desk it's where of course anybody sitting at my desk could see what it said and the first thing it said was have more parties and and we did i mean actually i i was at some point we would maybe talk about sociability and solidarity at, at some point i decide you know we we needed to hear more as a department and i thought we just need to have more parties and one day i was you know in my office and Le liana who was one of my own phd students 
came in to see me and, and Liana was a Malaysian, uh, or still is a Malaysian, <laughs> a Malaysian Muslim, she just happens to not be a student anymore. <laughs> And she came in to see me. She said, Tom, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, oh, yeah, what's that? And she said, uh, well, it's about the parties. And I said, yeah. And she said, what you don't know is for some of us, it's not that we can't drink. It's that we can't be in the room while you are. And so we can't come. We cannot come to the. To, and I was just like, oh, what have I done? This is, aren't I, a, you know, aren't I a terrible human being? Isn't this awful? Is it, you know? and, and of course, the first thing you have to do is get over that shit and forgive yourself. <laughs> As she said, what you don't know is <laughs> you have to thank the person for revealing to you the thing that you did not know. And then talk about what the, what the, the um, uh, alternatives are. And what in that discussion, you know, and what Liana said as much as I was thinking was, do not stop having the parties with alcohol. Still have parties with alcohol, but have something else as well. And, and that's the thing about inclusion. It's not about saying, you know, now I'm not going to do this. It's about saying, what can I do as well that will include these people who can't come to that part of what is, you know, very much part of, um, a, you know, British culture is to have a drink. Um, and so what we did was we invented Friday donuts. <laughs> and, and on a Friday morning, you know, the, the, we get a whole load of donuts in and the, and the researchers all go down to the common room, obviously not now, um, to, um, to share donuts. And so we just put something in which was, um, which everybody could come to. And of course, you know, some people didn't want to come to the drinking parties because not for some religious reason, but because, you know, it was at night, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather go home, you know, and so it's about variety. So variety leading to inclusion, inclu inclusion helping lead to diversity. And so it's about thinking about things in those other ways. But you know what, you will have failures, fix them. You know, sometimes you, you change something, it doesn't work, go back to how you did it before or change it yet again. And um, if you're doing enough to make a difference, you will get things wrong. Um, so what else have we got? Your microphone's off. <laughs> now, Tom, you've talked about the 95% that you've convinced and you've been obviously in a position of leadership uh, and more or less having some power in your hands. What do other people, you know, in your department, uh, what do students, uh, uh, professors who have not so much power in their own hands, what would be their possibilities to, for, for uh, uh, affecting change? Okay, so I think that there are two answers to this question. And the first one is a triage that I do. And then the second one, we'll talk about reach. If I, if I go off on a tangent again, remind me to talk about reach. Because <laughs> I might well. Um, so the first one is, the triage is, there are some things that you control. And it doesn't matter how senior or junior you are, there are actually some things you control, even if the only thing you control is your own behavior. There are some things that you don't control, but you can have influence over. And for different people, they have influence over different things. It might be something you do through a committee um, membership. It might think, be something that you can do just by talking to other people more generally, but you can, you can exert an influence even though you don't control it. And of course, with those two things, if you control it, change it. If you have influence over it, join with others and exert that influence for the kind of things that you think should change. The third part of the triage is there are some things that you neither control nor have influence over. And apart from, you know, dinner party conversation, they are a waste of your time. And I see people struggling 
to do something. We must do something about something over which they have no control or influence. And so stop doing that. Think about the things that you have control and control or influence over and start acting on those. And then now we get to reach. And so this is the thing about reach. So I, you know, I'm now president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. I've been a dean, I've been a head of department. I give talks like this. I, you know, all sorts. I'm on diversity committees all over the place. I have a very long reach. And of course, it is important that I use my long reach to its fullest extent and, and take that sphere of influence and influence it. But everybody has some reach. It might be that the only reach that you have is to the other side of the bench at which you work or the other side of the desk at which you work, and that is the fullest extent of your reach. That does not mean that you can do nothing. And it is incumbent upon you to use the fullest extent of your reach, no matter what your reach is. And it might be so, you know, particularly, you know, around issues of inclusion. So the first thing I should say is you cannot be selectively inclusive. You're either inclusive or you're not. It's as straightforward as that. Now, if you think about your office, your lab, you know, anything, you know, is your, is your office, your lab a welcoming environment? Is it selectively welcoming? Is it, oh, we welcome people that look and sound like us, but we're a bit suspicious of people who don't. You know, it's about thinking about those things and it's about saying, well, what can I do to make this space more inclusive tomorrow than it was yesterday and if the answer to that is what i can do is ask the person opposite me um you know who let's say they're from another religion asking oh how do you celebrate i've heard about i've heard about this thing called eid how do you celebrate it you know people like those kind of questions and they're not rude they're you know people like people to be curious about their lives um, as long as it's done in a positive way. It might be, actually, do you know what? I'm going to bring in a packet of biscuits. And if the only thing you can do to make your workplace more inclusive is to bring in a packet of biscuits, bring in a packet of biscuits. And those small acts are not insignificant because they build up around the place. They start to change the culture to being one which is more welcoming, and being more welcoming is the first step to being more inclusive. And so, yes, our leaders should be, you know, I was a dean, I would, you know, I would spend a lot of time and should have spent a lot of time working on university policy. But if you're not in that role, and you don't influence or control university policy, but what you do influence is, how friendly your lab is. Influence the thing that you can influence. Um, yeah. God, may I interrupt with the next question? <laughs> You've talked about uh, these grants, six month postdoc grants. Uh, were they especially designed? You know, you said it's for men and women, but was there a quota involved that you would further some? you know, at least a number of women and how many grants did you actually uh, give, give to, to postdocs? Um, so, so well, the, the grants were given to the, to the academics, to the PIs to generate the postdocs. While I was head of department, hang on, I need to count. Sophia had two, Charlotte had two. When I was head of department, we gave out five. They did, in, they in fact all were to women who were returning to maternity leave. It wasn't until after I became head of department that the first man received one of the awards. Um, so we gave out, we gave out five of them. Two women had them twice and, and, and one had them, had it once. Um, 
yeah and and actually so so you'll be aware that we have this um thing here called ref where the government reviews our departments very in detail and one of the things that was allowed in the last ref was that if a, if a woman had had maternity leave she did not have four papers is what we had to present so she did not have to present four papers for each maternity leave she could present one less paper and both Sophia and Charlotte who had had the um, the awards in the period that was leading up to the last ref both of them came to me and said I do not need nor do I want to submit fewer papers <laughs> Because you know they had managed to continue their work, their work, and you know, and it it was a brilliant line to be at because we had the review of the papers, but we also have you know some narrative from the head of department saying how wonderful we were, and to be able to say that both of these women had requested and even demanded that their all of their papers be recorded be recorded and used was a great you know it was a great thing to be able to say for the. For the department so that that was how often it was used you know so we still do have you know a huge mismatch of male um, and female within the department you know in spite of the fact that you know we're talking about a decade's work you know you replace academics at a rate of one maybe two a year and so when there are 50 of you you know it's a long time you know even if every appointment you made was a woman it would be a long time before you'd get up to um equal numbers and so um, yeah, the, the, you know, the statistics are, you know, you are more likely to want one of these awards if you are a woman. We have fewer women, you know, we haven't yet got to the place where anybody has had to ask the question, can we afford to give yet another one this year? Because we, we just aren't at those kinds of numbers. And remember, it is an investment, not, a, not an expenditure. And who did fund these grants? Whether so private came... funders or science foundations? No, 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 they came from internal college money. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you haven't got to the question of quotas. Is that well, quotas. something? So, no, no, so it was, it, it, so it, it turns out, it, you know, with that particular one, it was unnecessary, you know, so we did, you know, why have a quota if you don't need one? Um, and, and I'm not a, great i have to say i'm not a great fan of quotas um i know that there's a lot of um range of views around quotas i like targets i think without targets you you, you you're walking blindfolded but i think quotas can often be um it's one of those things around which there is sufficient controversy that you can generate more opposition by placing a quota where you, particularly where you don't need it, um, or it won't be useful. And, you know, then you get into this whole world of you just, you, you take part of your community and you enrage it, and then it starts to positively try to stop you doing the good things that you're doing. I think that that can be a real problem. And actually within the scale of the things that we were doing, that we never came across anything where anybody said, they wanted a quota for anything over which we were, you know, we were dealing with. You know, we don't have quotas for um, things like the, um, you know, the makeup of a shortlist. Um, we do have very strong guidelines. Um, and we do, you know, we have a whole series of, of efforts um, to go into making that shortlist be representative. So, so what we have, the, the concept that we use is called, um, uh, you know, know your pool. So know your pool of candidates and it, and it comes in two meanings. And the first meaning of it is, what is the, you know, what's the, what's the statistics of the pool of candidates that you have for your role? So if, you know, in physics, um, for instance, 20% of postdocs roughly are women, then what you should be targeting on your shortlist is 20% women, not 50% women, because your pool has that characteristic. So it has that meaning. Um, 
and the way in which we say that needs to be achieved, if it can't be achieved by, and these things seldom can, if it can't be achieved with just making an advert, you have to know your pool in another way. You have to know your pool in the sense that you can go out to people and invite them to apply. And we're very, very strict on how we do it. Because what we don't want to happen is nepotism. We don't want me going out to um, you know, the, the younger chemist community and saying, oh, let me give you a job at Imperial College. That would be wrong. So what we do is we actually split the people involved in the tasks. And so we have a group of people who are the search committee and they can go out and they can say to someone, we've got this job at Imperial College, um, we'd love you to apply, please come and visit us, we can show you the department, we can talk to you about you know, housing in London. We, you know, they can do anything they like except offer a job because they are not the appointment committee. The appointment committee meets the candidates in the traditional sense, you know, have, you know, have candidates, they, they apply, they have CVs, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And the appointment panel makes the decision on who gets the job. The search committee, their job is to make sure that the shortlist, one is um, a representative of the pool, but the th again, this thing of this double win, because you're actively seeking people. The short, ever since we introduced this, the short lifts have been so much stronger. You know, I do not think that there is a single short list that has, that has come from a recruitment pro, uh, process since we introduced this that I would have got onto. <laughs> let, alone, let alone got the job. <laughs> you know. The quality, when you actively seek people out, the quality of your shortlist is amazing. And so we have, again, this double success. We get the diversity success because we are going out and looking for people of all different types from all different places who perhaps wouldn't ordinarily apply to us. And from that, we get the diversity. But, you know, the, you know we're, go, we're going out and finding people because we're actively searching, we're finding people who are superb. And we, you know, and we just have these amazing shortlists. We then do one third thing. And I guess, you know, so you, you, you mentioned Athena Swan and Athena Swan Gold. So this is, you know, so I've, perhaps I've told you something which I think would be Athena Swan Silver. Now, this is the difference between Athena Swan Silver and Athena Swan um, Gold. So we have a, jo a job to appoint. And of course, in the end, one of that wonderful short list of people who got interviewed gets the job and the others don't. We then offer the unsuccessful candidates who we think, you know, had someone else been present, maybe you'd have got it or, you know, you're, you weren't quite ready yet. You were great, but you weren't quite ready yet. We offer them mentoring, mentoring from our department. So not go back home to your home department and, you know, hopefully you can find a mentor we actually offer them active mentoring from our department. And that's the difference between a silver action and a gold action. It really is about ensuring those people who, you know, and you do sit, you know, we all know it, don't we? Um, you know, we've all had that wonderful, wonderful postdoc who interviews dreadfully. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, and we've done, we've torn our hair out. We've done everything we possibly can to help that person. But then someone from a place where they were interviewed and they interviewed dreadfully, helps them and it makes such a difference to them personally you know and they might later on come to us because they were still looking for a job when we were advertising the next one they might go somewhere else but you know what we will have we will have gained a friend of the department and in 10 years time when they're successful and they're reviewing a research proposal from Imperial College, we'll have gained a friend of the department. <laughs> you know, it's always, there's always another way of viewing it. <laughs> but now talking about this recruitment uh, issues, you know, we always hear there are implicit biases that the um, 
uh, the interviewers are not aware of? How could you actually avoid those implicit biases? What so, so there are lots of different ways in which people try and address this. And I think, I think the, sad, the, the, the sad truth is that um, the adjective that I would apply to all of those probably is badly. Um, but, but there are things that you can attempt to do. So simple things like um, what is one of the things that could be, you know, very good practice is at the beginning of the interview or, you know, when the candidate's not there, when the, the board is gathering, to read some statement about in, in implicit or unconscious bias. So take what is unconscious and make it conscious at the time of the thing that you are doing. Um, so some people do that. Again, I don't know whether it really has any effect, but you know, it's one of the things that's said. The other one is to, you know, to have a, somebody present at the interview and, and not a junior person, a senior person whose role within the interview is not to ask questions. Their role within the interview is to observe the, um, the, the interviewers so that they can bring up uh, instances where they think an unconscious bias is being played out. Yeah, and again, the level to which that's successful, I think it's, it's the kind of thing that is very easy to put in place, but if it is done badly, it will have, well, it might not even, it might not have a positive influence. It could possibly have a negative influence. And so you do have to think very carefully about how you can do that. I mean, of course, you know, the, um, unconscious bias training, um, but again, I have seen, so I've had unconscious bias training, I think six times now, and, and two of those times, I would say I left it thinking that was a very well done training session. You know, and so again, you have to think about the quality of these interventions, not just not just have a massive list of interventions. It's one of the things that's very easy to do in this area, particularly when at the beginning, when infused, is to think, oh, we've got to do this, we do this, we do this, and, you know, and you have this long list of interventions that don't get done well. And it is better to have, you know, except, as I said, all we're trying to do is to make tomorrow slightly better than yesterday. We're not trying to solve all the problems of the world. It is often better to have fewer interventions that are delivered well and once they're delivered, move on to the next one and move on to the next one. You know, there is, there will be plenty of time to work on this. It's not an, it's not an issue that's going to go away in the next six weeks. And so thinking about that, thinking about delivering each intervention well, so that it makes a difference, analyzing it. So, so, you know, you've got a report this afternoon on, you know, on what you're like, you know, don't let that be the last time that that is done, you know, regularly check ask people oh we did this what did you think the outcome of that was did this have did, did this have the effect that we thought it was going to and con continually review your progress and to change interventions um or to you know maybe sometimes um get get rid of them oh i have i've just seen the the um comment from Paloma Medina. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and so sorry, Hal, do you want to do you want to read it out? Yeah, yeah. I was just getting to that. Paloma Medina notes that women are mentored to death, but under sponsored. How can we improve sponsorship at a systemic level? Yeah, and so again, it's one of those things that you have to you have you know sponsorship comes from senior people taking responsibility. And one of the things that you need to work on with people is, and I, you know what, I had to, I had to get over this and, and, and work my way through it. In that, so when I think about my first research student, Richard, and, well, my first two, because, um, he was one of two, but I want to point him out particularly. He, so, you know, he so reminded me of myself when I was like that age. And to the extent of he had blonde hair, you know. 
And that is something that many of us do. So, so when we're going to put effort into somebody else, it's very often that you will hear the phrase, he, she reminds me of myself when I was that age. And that is an awful reason to select somebody for support and sponsorship. You know, like I said, he literally had blonde hair. And maybe it was because it was so stark that, it made, that I eventually realized that there are the people who are going to remind you of what you were like when you were that age are people like you. And what that leads to within the system is, is a propagation of people like you, people like me, a propagation of that. And so those of us who are more serious, senior, have to seriously ask ourselves what we mean by that phrase. And in fact, get rid of that phrase. What we should be looking at and seeing, I can see a young talent here. I can see somebody who is working very hard. I can see somebody who's very committed. Or again, in the business related sense of, and, and which is, oh, I've just seen someone who's performed a task really, really well. Do you know what? Next time there is something which is going to be a bit of a stretch task for them, I will remember that they performed the previous task really, really well. And, and I think as departmental managers, and I use the word manager particularly here rather than leader, as departmental managers, there are very, very few tasks that are not a career development opportunity for someone. And those tasks, the ones that aren't a career development opportunity for someone, you should give to a senior professor because they don't need to develop their career any further. The other tasks, you should have them mapped out, you know, and, 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 and don't wait until you're attempting to fill your admissions officer job or your exams officer job until you think about it. You know, think about what positive things those jobs provide and, and 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 so I'll refer to my own career here so I was an exams officer um, at the point at which I was offered that job I in fact I volunteered for that job because I was told we have exams officer and we have safety officer available which one would you like and I went for exams <laughs> I then became director of undergraduate studies and and at the point at which I was told I was doing that it was an instruction it wasn't a request I you know, said, this is going to destroy my academic career. I then became head of department, you know, anyway, all these various different administrative tasks that people are, and one of the things we do is that people should be protected from. In fact, I thought I was quite a well-organized person until I started working with the professional administrators in the exams office, who because I was willing to learn from those women, they were all women, I got more organized. And in fact, I managed to do more research when I was um, the exams officer than I had done previously, because I was more organized. I took something from there. There is something that job can give people. As I became director of, of um, undergraduate studies, I started meeting people from other departments much more. And, and in fact, that increased my networking. It got me to um, be able to talk to people from other departments about the influence that they could have on my work. And, and so built up that. Um, and so that job, which seems to be, you know, uh, be a, had advantages, you know, and so on and so forth. And every time I had a, a more significant um task to do my research improved and that's because all tasks can offer opportunity what you need and what i did have was the presence of people who would say to me actually tom if you think if you do this in that kind of way it will help you with your research if you do this in that so so mentoring is still there as an important thing but the opportunities of those tasks and working out what opportunities different tasks offer to people at different stages. And it might be, like I say, it brings them into contact with professionally well-organized people. 
it brings them into contact with a wider network across the university. It brings them into, con you know, it does various different things and then you can map out the appropriate people to give to those tasks. So actually it helps lift their career rather than suppress their career. Thank you, Tom. Now there's been several comments on cultural issues. You know, uh, women being raised not to go into the men subjects. Uh, uh, once mm. they, they, they have families, children, most of the workload um, remains with the women. You know, are there some recommendations maybe you could give there or from your experience, are there some recommendations that would work? So recommendation number one, choose your husband as wisely as I chose mine. <laughs> um, you know, and, and you know, and I don't wish to realize it. I, you know, I, it's just a significant problem. Um, so there is, a, so okay, so there's a thing about role models, and you know, so and and it, it, it ties into that mentoring um, comment as well that we, you have to decide what success means. No, actually, do you know what I'm going to. Re rephrase that from from the beginning having children should change your life if you don't want having if you don't want to change your life then don't have children the problem is not that children change people's lives it's that the negative impact of that change is far greater on women than it is on men and so what you need to start thinking about as an individual who's dealing with that as opposed to an organization that is trying to mitigate that is what can i do that enables me to deal with um the these changes that are happening in my life and the people who can who are you know best able to help you in that regard are people who have been coping with that change successfully and so that you know so this is a, a really important part of your interventions because those people are not going to come and offer you help not because they're horrible but because they don't realize you need it they're not thinking that you need it you need to ask you need to say this is the support that I need from you, can you help me with this? This is what I need from you, can you help me with this? And so having a, a, a very active um, approach to gathering the help and support that you need. And, and I can't say, you know, although, you know, organizations can put formal mentors in place and, you know, people with labels like line man and all of those kind of things, on the whole, I find that I, I, they don't, they, that, those, cis, those schemes don't seem to be as effective as when somebody finds for themselves the person who is the right person to help you. And that's a, the thing I said about, you know, going, so if we had been doing the role models bit of my presentation, there would have been a woman on there called Julia Higgins. And, you know, I came across her in a particular set of projects. And I realized what an amazing woman she, um, she is, and she is a truly amazing woman. And, and I went to her and I said, you know, I'm struggling with this. You know, I, I wondered whether you had any ideas. Of, and, and of course, you know, not only amazing scientist and engineer, but also a lovely person. And of course she helped. And we continue, I mean, in fact, we, I would call ourselves friends now, um, you know, and so it, there is a thing about f finding the support that you need, because actually the only person who knows the support that you need is you. And so then you can match what are your needs with the available support network that there is in front of you and to match it up. What I would also say is don't be too rigorous on I expect that person to look like I am going to look when I am their age that is as much a mistake as when I said it the other way around you know that person might not look like you they might not be in the same job as you 
It might not be that scene, that woman um, uh, senior scientist. It might be that um, head librarian. It might, they might not, um, you know, one of the things that, again, the problem isn't the children. <laughs> the children are a great benefit. The children are a great boon in your life. The problem is the time constraint. And so actually there are all sorts of different people that operate under serious time constraints. And so, and I bring you back to the, um, example of me when I was, you know, director of undergraduate studies, I had to work under incredible time constraints and incredibly efficiently and make decisions about what research I was focusing on and not. And, and I got very good at dealing with how do I develop my research role while I have these time constraints. So there are people there who do not look like you, who are dealing with the issues that you are dealing with if only you can make the connection between, oh, this is this issue that I've got is actually that issue, and that issue, that person, I know that person does that really well. Let me go and talk to them about how they do that. And, you know, and I, I mentioned the headline, but don't, don't be snobbish about who you get advice from. Sometimes, the person in the room who has the best advice is the cleaner. You know, ask them. <laughs> you know, and 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 then you discover that there is a much greater support network out there than you thought there was. Thanks, Tom. We just have three minutes left, and you wanted to say something about sociability and the. Uh, oh yes. So maybe we can spend the last couple of minutes on that. So this is one of the things, so this is one of the departmental kind of level things. And, and I think it's really worth asking yourself um, as a department, these kinds of questions. And so the, to do it in just one question, why do we work together? That might be the, that might be the question that if you were doing it literally with one question, why do we choose to collaborate with each? And the sociability solidarity um, idea is sometimes I choose to work with you because it's, there's a tough world out there and you and me together, we can make an alliance in mutual um, self-interest to, to work together. Sometimes what it is is, do you know what? I really like you and I'm going to find an excuse for us to work together. Let's come up with a project we can do. And they are both, you know, perfectly legitimate reasons for why people um, want to work together. But of course, within a department, you want a range of those. You want, um, you want projects where there are elements of both of it in the project. And so, what you can do as a departmental leader is you can actually manipulate solidarity and um, sociability. So for instance, have more parties. Ha have more parties was me saying, I think that Imperial College, we were at that time, we are really big on the solidarity, but we are really weak on the sociability. So I put in lots of interventions to increase the sociability, increase the social friendly interactions within the department and having more parties, donuts, um, sending out messages to celebrate people. So I, you know, dear all, they, they got known as the Friday morning emails. Dear all, please join me in congratulating somebody on whatever it is. And, and of course you scale it, you know, for a senior professor, it has to be a, you know, a major grant, a paper in nature or whatever. But for a, a junior person, it would be something much smaller scale. That you would so everybody feels that they're being congratulated and part of the group um also i think that also works well at times like now when all news seems unrelentingly bad just having on friday morning your head of department sending some good news out actually is a really good thing to do you know it's not because of diversity in particular but because everybody's feeling miserable and so, so thinking about those scales, so thinking about as a department, are we a, a social department? Are we more a solidarity kind of department? And how do we, and how can we manipulate those? So, so 
this thing, what increases solidarity? So increasing solidarity is external hostility. That tends to increase solidarity. Um, but of course, internal hostility as well. So, or things which are seen as being internal hostility. And you can gauge where your department sits on a, you know, a, a, on, a, on a matrix of these. And of course, what you want is a bit of solidarity and a bit of sociability. You don't want 100% solidarity and 100% sociability because then you're some kind of religious cult. <laughs> what you want is, you know, a combination of the two. But also then what, when you recognize where you are and you nudge yourself roughly where you want to be, what you then need to realize is the external world is influencing you. And one of the things I see in organizations, which is very, very common, is the external world becomes more hostile. And then suddenly the, you know, the, the senior management team go into, to, into command and control methods. And you know, we must do this and we will do that and we must do this. And command and control methods will exacerbate the fact that the external world is feeling more hostile. What you actually need to do at the moment, it's, it feels so counterintuitive as a, as a senior manager, but at the point at which the external world is getting more aggressive towards your organization, you need to tune down those elements of your management style, which are about risk and performance metrics, um, uh, financial bonuses. Those, you need to dial those down in order to get people back to the place where there's a level that they can handle, and you dial up the sociability. But then there are other times when, you know, everything in the garden is rosy, that you might actually want to dial down your actions which are about sociability and dial up your actions which are about solidarity in order to maintain a balance. And of course, to know whether you're maintaining a balance, you have to listen to your community. What is it telling you about what it is experiencing? And, you know, and at times like now where, you know, so we're here in London, we're, we're back in lockdown tomorrow. You know, this is a time to, well, as my head of department did um, last night, have a, a Zoom quiz. You know, it's, a, it's about, you know, what can, we, what can we do with where our reach is in the things we do control in order to help our community deal with the external stuff that's going on? Thank you so much, Tom. I, I have to interrupt now because we are really at the end of our time. Thank you so much for, for all the attendees. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, Tom, uh, for, uh, for the insights you gave us. And uh, I would like to close this meeting actually with uh, a quote from uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe saying, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough we must do and actually with this quote uh, i would like to thank you all and say goodbye thank you <laughs>